On today's episode of the Cryptoverse, I have a chat with Jeremy Kaufman from The Library Project. TunnelBear is the simple VPN app that makes it easy to browse the web privately and enjoy a more open and secure internet experience. Try TunnelBear for free by checking out the link in the video description below. Hi there guys and welcome to the latest episode of the Cryptoverse, your regular dose of news and commentary on Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies and blockchains. I am your host Chris Coney and today I am with a gentleman by the name of Jeremy Kaufman. He is the founder and chief executive officer of Library Inc. That's L-B-R-Y. So Library is both library.io is the website and Library is also a company. We'll get into that later. But for those of you that don't know, Library is, this is my description of it, a decentralized library of content that aims to cut out all the middlemen in between content creators like me and all of their fans that want to support them. So Jeremy, is that a reasonably accurate high level description of what Library is? Uh, so hello, Cryptoverse, and yeah, it is. Uh, that, that's pretty good. Uh, so library is a, a protocol, which means it's uh, it's it's not a it's not a service that's controlled by one company. It's something. It's a piece of technology that's open source that that anyone can can pick up and use. But it's designed to do exactly that: allow people to uh, publish uh, and share content with anyone else in the world and have no one in between. So connecting creators and consumers directly, um, we think is a a much better experience for both parties. Right. That's actually when I'm when I'm uh, trying to explain what blockchain is to anyone who doesn't know what it is. The that's the fundamental benefit I describe. I say, look, think of any industry um, where the whole industry is is based on being a middleman to some kind of transaction, like real estate agents, whatever it is, that can be replaced by a blockchain, right? And of course, a financial transaction was the first one, but projects like Bitland and Library and and who knows where it's going to go next. But it's one of those, what do they call it? Disintermediation. Yeah, 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 that's exactly right. And I, you know, it's, I'm sure you're you're familiar with this. There's so many misconceptions, you know, surrounding blockchain and and what it is and why it's significant and why does it matter. Uh, We we put out a, a funny image, I think, just on Twitter. There's a nice flow chart of like why all these companies don't need a blockchain, right? You know, a blockchain is a, I think the right way to think about it actually is, is it's a database first. As a computer scientist, that's it's a blockchain is a database first, and it's a it has some some really cool properties. You want to make sure you actually need those properties for for the application you're using it to solve the problem. For. Right. Uh, otherwise, if you implement an open etc. blockchain like like Andreas Antonopoulos talks about, an open decentralized etc. etc. Yeah. You might realize, oh, oh, that's actually put me out of business. <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah. what I mean? If you do it properly rather than a permissioned private blockchain, which is like you, like you say, you may as well just use a centralized database because it's more efficient than a blockchain, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I've I've talked to some people in in fintech, and they've kind of told me behind the scenes, like we just use the word blockchain to push our pet projects through. It's just a it, wow. it's got enough of buzz to it that we the project we wanted to do five years ago when we say we're doing it on the blockchain now we get to do it. Is that right, mate? Is that what your <laughs> yeah. insiders are telling you? Uh, I'm not saying that that's true across <laughs> the board. I just had a couple of people I know who are in the industry that is. That's basically what they told me. It's within the realms of reality. Put it that yeah. way. You know how corporate corporate culture is, right? Yeah. So yeah. yeah. So you mentioned there that library is like a protocol. So I mean, I've started experimenting with it recently. So instead of in your web browser, you instead of putting like HTTP blah blah blah, you put in LBRY colon forward slash forward slash, and then the identifier, and that takes you to the piece of content rather than to a web page, right? That, yeah, that's exactly right. So the idea is, uh, you know, the library blockchain maintains, um, again, it's a database. It's like it's a catalog of content. This is all of the content that is available on the library network. And we, library provides a URL scheme um, exactly like HTTP. You know, people, sometimes people ask library who our competitors are, not sure we can talk about how we want to change the way that people watch movies and, you, and YouTube and these kind of things. But really, we're going to measure our success by how much is happening over LBRY instead of HTTP or BitTorrent. Very good point. That is a very good point. Yeah, actually, that is a good point. So like I, re- I read this, one of the first ever business management books that I read uh, when I started my very first business in 2005 was a book called Blue Ocean Strategy, right? Yeah, and it was, the subtitle was something like 
um, what was it called? How to open up new markets and make the competition irrelevant or something like that. And it was called Blue Ocean Strategy, which I think has now been co-opted as a phrase, right? Find blue oceans. And that. But at the time, yeah. it was groundbreaking because the idea is that a blue ocean as opposed to a red ocean. And the reason that the ocean is red is because there's so much competition and there's all these bloody noses and it's made the ocean red. Whereas a blue ocean was an uncont... That was it. The subtitle is how to open up uncontested market space and make yeah. the competition irrelevant. So when when we talk about and this is kind of abundance mindset right if we can get away from thinking that we're competing for a limited pie that's going to be a good thing so and and i've been in marketing most of my career so i always think about rather than thinking who's buying the thing that my clients are offering why don't we look at people who are not buying the client's thing which way outnumber the people that are buying it and figure out how to sell it to them right you yeah know what I'm saying? Exactly. so what I'm getting at here from library's point of view is people may begin using library as the very first way they ever started monetizing their content or even producing content rather than co-opting it from say YouTube or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, honestly speaking, I think probably in the initial days we are more people are probably going to already have, have content that are, sure. that are going to bring it onto library, but uh, we absolutely welcome people who are creating content for, for the very first time. Um, you know, I think I think the probably the the blue ocean for for library is that it's it's really changing the oh God, it's such a, uh, uh, ch changing the paradigm, right? That's such a terrible cliched phrase. <laughs> but, uh, it, you know, all of these other platforms and systems they create this set of incentives where people are competing to lock things away, right? That is the existing business mm -hmm. model of companies who want to publish and share content. It's we want to take this content and we want to lock it away. The, the library kind of turns those incentives on its head. It, 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 all the incentives of the library are for shared participation. It's for, it's, there's no, um, you know, we're not demanding any exclusivity, ex exclusivity. We're not taking any cut, um, you know, so there's no, it, the incentives are for everyone to be joining and participating rather than for us to be, for locking things away and, and to lock our customers in. Yes, right. Very good point, mate. So locking it away, why do they do that? Yeah, that's so that because if they can control it, they can charge a fee for the protection, essentially. Right. I mean, YouTube. So, you know, YouTube, as an example, takes 45 percent of every every dollar that a creator makes on YouTube. Forty five percent of that is going to YouTube. Why is YouTube able to extract 45 percent? Right. It's not it's not because uh, delivering a, a video is well. Delivering a video at the quality that YouTube does is a fundamentally hard problem. I don't mean I don't want to sell short the wonderful engineers who work at Google, but it's not a 45% of the dollar hard problem. It's they they're able to extract 45% because they have a captive audience. What YouTube, what you're actually paying that 45% to YouTube for, isn't as much for the technology, but it's about the viewers. Uh, and so YouTube has an incentive to be um, ha having as much happening on their platform so that they can have that audience and then they're actually selling that audience to other creators. So I put my content on YouTube and I give YouTube 45% because that's where the audience is. And also they got the advertisers, right? As well. So uh, ad advertisers too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the actual business model relies on that centralization because otherwise it doesn't work. You know, they have to be like, a, I'd call those them an advertising agency at their core is that they connect the audience with the advertisers and, you know, people who want to advertise with the people who want to be advertised to, uh, connecting those audiences together. I mean, on my YouTube videos, the ads that are constantly running are things like um, spread betting companies and trading this and yeah. whatever the stuff. Because I guess it's picked up on the idea that my videos are in and around Bitcoin, and they then shove these uh, trading ads yeah. in front of the in front of the videos and whatnot. Yeah, the the, the technology for building profiles about. Uh, viewers has really come along a long way and especially what's called you know re quote retargeting you know right. you, you go on and you view a product on amazon one time and now you're going to see it on your facebook feed you're now, the, see now the adverts that's stalking you around the web yeah, yeah right it's a uh, it's it's a little creepy you know <laughs> it's like I, I just i i was just curious about this product stop trying to sell to me <laughs> it's um it's a scale though i think there, there is a balance to be struck because I don't think people, and, and again, this is me talking as a marketeer, I don't think people mind being advertised to. It's irrelevant advertising they don't like. And I, and I guess retargeting is a, is a, an attempt to make it more relevant. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
Yeah, I agree. And I'm, I'm actually sympathetic to that. Like, right, I'd rather is it's kind of right. Advertising is necessary to a lot of these business models. The fact that we can watch things for free it is because of advertisers, right? And uh, and if, I, if advertisers are going to exist, I agree with you. I'd rather see ads for things that I might want than ads that are, uh, you know, um, right. completely irrelevant. And, and advertising serves a useful purpose. Uh, you know, there are entrepreneurs and creative people and engineers who have come up with something new, something great, something that's going to make your life better. And they do have to figure out a way to, to make you aware of that fact. Uh, you right. know, some of the behaviors sometimes cross the line and then can, can skeep you out a little cross bit. Cross the line, you see. So this is this would be the whole debate, which is, whereas where do we draw the line between yeah. privacy and all that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's and a different discussion, probably, you know? <laughs> there's probably a billion different ones. People have different preferences. Yeah, absolutely. Now, so let's talk about something you just touched on there, which is some people will be quite happy to pay with their time. So on YouTube, people are effectively paying with their time to sit and say, watch at least 30 seconds of the ad and that actually pays the content creator, right? So the, people are paying for free content anyway, one way or another. So actually one of the questions I wrote down for you, which is, do you, I'm sure, I'm sure this is a scale as well. I'm sure there are people that would never pay for content and some people that eagerly want to pay for content. I know that to be true because as soon as I started putting a, you know, support the cryptoverse by sending a Bitcoin donation, I'm now getting a Bitcoin donation every other day from somebody. Wow. Uh, which surprised me because I, I, I honestly, prior to that, didn't honestly believe there was that many people. I thought that were just, you know, fringe folk that would just give you a few pence here and there. But I mean, they're coming in in five and ten dollar donations, and I'm like, that just kind of changed my opinion, right? So the question is, do people want to pay for the content, and is it worth them paying it to get rid of the ads? Right. Uh, well, so first <clears throat> you have to consider the. This is this one's probably. Uh, I, a given, but I'll state it anyway. Depends on the cost. Um, exactly. So there's no amount of advertising that's going to cover me watching a video that costs that the producer of that video wants to charge five dollars for, right? Right. Uh, or yeah, I'd have to watch ads for for several hours. Um, <laughs> you know, when you're talking about a YouTube video, the cost of you watching that ad is um, it's on the order of a penny, uh, maybe half a penny to penny, maybe a little over a penny, uh, is what is what that cost is to have you watch that thirty second ad, and what library kind of is saying is let's make those costs explicit, mm -hmm. right? So let's, if, if a penny is what it costs to watch that YouTube video, let's make that explicit. Um, the data says that you're right. Most people would rather watch ads. Um, according to my research into this and our team's research into this, actually about 70, 80% of people, and this is not based off of usage of our platform. This is, this is industry research. Industry data, right. Um, th that 70, 80% of people would rather watch a 30 second advertisement than then pay a penny, which is kind of weird to think really? about it because it's like how, how little do you value your time? Um, but, but library makes these costs explicit. The producer can charge a penny. And now we haven't built this part of it out, but we've always envisioned, Hey, if you want to watch an ad, if that, you know, we can still match you with an advertiser. If an advertiser wants to cover the penny cost of watching that video, let the ad, let the ad play. If you want to click the ad, you pay a penny. But let's make it explicit. Let's not, and let's give consumers the option, right? Because I, you know, personally myself as a YouTube watcher, I would basically, if I could have an account set up and pay a penny to not watch the 30 second ad to get to the show that I want to watch, I'd do that every time. Mm -hmm. um, um, but you know, some people would prefer to watch the ad and let's just make it explicit and give people the choice. A lot of what library is about is like, let's, let's not make choices for people. Let's let people make choices for themselves. And right. That's absolutely key. I mean, on a, on a high level, philosophical level, I think that's the thing that's wrong with the world is that people are not being given choices to make their own choices, choices being made for them, right? And are being uh, put on them. That's the definition of authoritarianism, I guess, right? Yeah, absolutely. And library is definitely a, an anti-authoritarian company. <laughs> right. And that's not to say that we that everyone has to switch to a paid model. Right? There's, there's room for everyone in there, the people that want to pay for their content by watching a 30 second ad. Cool, there'll be platforms for that, right? But the people that just, you know, I'll just, I'll just, like I did, bought five pounds worth of library credits and then just, just, I mean, it's going to take me forever to go through that at this rate because yeah. it's only a couple of credits here and there. And, you know, it's just, you get straight to it. And actually, right. when I thought about publishing on library, I thought, wow, it actually causes me to rethink the whole format of the cryptoverse because I'd, I'd strip out all of the stuff that isn't content, like the sponsorship slot, this, that, the other, all the ads, all of that, um, so that you could just, 
click on the library link for an episode of the Cryptoverse and boom, it would be straight into the content. And when it ended, it would end and there wouldn't be no bumpers, no nothing, no, no need for me to promote anything either side of it because content there, I got paid for it, deal's done, right? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And I'm, I'm excited to hear that, that you've checked it out. Uh, you know, it's definitely, uh, I hope you enjoyed the experience. It's definitely a beta, right? That's, uh, we, we only just launched library and, you know, we're really excited that we're able to show that we can in an entirely decentralized way, um, you know, discover access and purchase content. You know, there have been decentralized right. systems before, but all they really handled was access, mm -hmm. right? All BitTorrent provided was access. BitTorrent does not provide decentralized discovery, and it certainly doesn't provide decentralized purchase. Right. Um, so we're, we're trying to add those things to a decentralized system. Um, and, you know, with where we're at, we're like, great, this is, uh, this is possible. You know, we think it's a, it's a decent experience, but now we've got our, our job over the next year is to make it a great experience. Right. And that is one of the things that really slapped me in the face about, about library is that, again, as a marketeer, I can appreciate this because... What you're doing is you're reverse engineering the market, which is, you know, there's that statistic that says that like 80% of all new businesses fail within three years of existence and all that. Yeah. Um, and that's because the most people start businesses back to front. They, they, this is a good idea. And then they take it to market and go, who wants to buy this? All right now, this is such a simple idea yet. It seems to be repeatedly, it's the mistake people repeatedly make starting businesses. Um, so the correct way to do it is, is businesses are supposed to serve a need. So you identify a bunch of people that want something that doesn't exist and then you create it for them, right? And that's a, such a simple idea yet. The, I, the reason I believe this 80% statistic exists is because people are starting businesses without checking if there's a market. And the difference, and I think the crypto space is just, just you know, full of that. You know, it's a good idea, right? Uh, we'll figure out what problem it solves and there's lots of pivoting going on. But what sticks out to me about library is that you are taking a uh, we're t taking it from the user experience first and then coming back from that right which is why you're like what's library well it's kind of a blockchain it's kind of a protocol it's kind of a it's all of this stuff really but it doesn't matter what it is right. is the way you should describe it is how it's used you, right. you know what i'm saying and that's what strikes me about you guys uh, yeah absolutely and in fact um we haven't even our, our marketing is still and our design of our page and everything is still not aimed maximally at the mainstream, you know, in the early days, which and I still consider this the early days, you know, we want people who are a little, um, let's say above average in their, in their capacities and, and uh, technical capacities, what they're used to using and so on. But library is absolutely something that's designed to take it to the mainstream. You, you don't, you know, you, good technology is invisible. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't, I use website, you know, most people use websites all the time. They have no idea what HTTP and TCP and all the, the, you know, if you start drilling down the incredible stack of things that happens for you to, to do something simple, like simple, quote, simple, <laughs> quotes, like purchase something on, on Amazon, it's, it's, uh, it, it's nuts. And so sometimes I, I, we, I have this problem with library where I start explaining library and people are like, they, we get lost in the weeds of like, oh, okay, so there's a blockchain and then there's this decentralized DHT and then you're doing these, these uh, exchanges and so on. Like, they're like that's, that's really complicated. I'm like, no, 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 no. Let me pull back up to the surface level. Someone just opens it and they type and then they watch something. It's very, they, they, we had to make a lot of magic for this to work, but it's very simple for the, the user experiences. They, users don't, shouldn't need to know what a blockchain is to use library. They should have no idea. They should open something up and they should click things and they should get what they want. And that's, you know, that's, that's what we need to deliver. Right. And unless there's a way of once, I don't know, things like open source and blockchain get into the mass psychology and have a rough definition. So if someone says, oh, does it operate on an open blockchain? If someone says yes, without knowing what that means, they can go, oh, that means that there are no middlemen and it can't be shut down. As long as they've yeah. got those basic definitions, they can, the consumer can have a checkpoint, like is it open source, right? And you say yes. They might not know what the hell open source is technically, but if they go, well, yeah. that means that it can be audited. Right? That's all they yeah. need to know, and then they'll they'll qualify it in that way. Well, I I uh, I, I I hope those things make it into the mass psychology right. at, at, at some point. Um, you know, I'm I guess I'm I'm possibly a little skeptical that that will that, that will ever happen. I really hope it does. I I mean I would I would love the day where people are like, oh, if it's not a blockchain, it's not open source. It's a let's not use it. But I don't. Um, 
particularly in open source, right? We've seen that. It's been around for a long time. O open source, you know, our, everything we do is open source and as open as possible. It's MIT licensed. You can copy library tomorrow and make your own business on top of it. We can't do a thing about it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, my impressions are, you know, open source means something to maybe two, 5% of people. And, and we love those people. We're a team full of people to, to whom that means something. But I don't know, uh, right? Uh, li Linux on the desktop has been uh, five years away for 20 years. Uh, I'm not sure we're <laughs> not sure we're ever going to get there. True, true. I do think it will happen though, because it's, yeah. I think it's already happened. So things things that used to be reserved for the the highly technical early adopters. I mean, even computer language like RAM or hard drive or whatever, you know, stuff like that. Um, operating system, you know, that's something like I think that's entered the max mass le mass lexicon like iOS or whatever. And you, I think people know what an operating system is in the masses. Um, and I think it's generational. So as as the young people just who would generally like new stuff and techie stuff, they just get used to, you know, like this generation won't know a world without the internet type of thing. And they'll grow up with a vocabulary that's second nature to them, which to everyone else might be like brand new, right? You know what I mean? So I think it yeah. will happen. How long it'll take, who knows, right? Yeah, yeah. So another question I had for you was, how come, because library's been around a while compared to most blockchain projects. So how come it was so early to the party as a platform? Because there's lots of if people here like, oh yeah, library's a decentralized content distribution and platform, et cetera. Hey, there are lots of those, right? But I mean, I, whenever I hear about any of these projects, the first thing I do is go straight to the source, you know, join the Slack chat, start downloading whatever it is I can find and just start looking at it. And primarily I see if I can actually use it. And right. can, can I can I execute the use case and how close is it? So I've tested made save, I've tested storage, I've tested the bin, that Sire thing, which is actually quite good. Uh, although it's, it, it stops before I can, it, I think it stops short of like you were talking about being a full blown user experience. Now, yes, it's all in development, but my experience of library is that it's a, it is and it's, this is not just from your FAQ, which claims this. I've verified this for myself. It's the closest to being releasable software than anything I've used in this space, which tell, which either mean you're really quick at developing this stuff or you've been doing it a while. So how come it was so early to the party and has been so advanced by now? Well, that's that's really great to hear. Uh, I uh, I think that it's, it's probably a, a mix of those two things. One, and this is... I, I had I had this, I had some sense of this getting into this, but to be honest, I you know like I've been into I, I think I was probably first aware of Bitcoin. I, I want to say early 2013, um, and found it very interesting as a technology. But like I'm not the kind of guy who is like always on to the next big thing. I'm not I'm not going out and checking 20, 30, 40 different crypto products. I've looked at a couple that are the most similar. I agree that in particular SIA, the, the guys who are doing that are, are good and they're delivering something that's that's uh, you know that's real. It's distinct from library what they're doing. It is. Uh, but they're 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 good guys. I like them. They, they actually um, came out what the first programmer for library and, and the SIA people came out of the same um, group at RPI, the same college. There's a, a, a right. great open source uh, development group there and they actually were all uh, all part of the same um same group five or six years ago so it's kind of funny how that's, that's working cool. out like a little but, bit uh, yeah. uh yeah i mean it, it work has been going on for a good amount of time i think it's also understanding we do i think have a mentality that some of these other places don't have i mean the, the amount of energy that some of these other companies put into creating hype and having people um, follow them and, and be the next big thing and generate buzz. And it's like, that's not a sustainable business. Sustainable. Like you have to actually deliver something, you know, we've put, you know, say 80 to 90%, maybe even more than 90%. I'd have to look at it exactly. Like all of our money goes into making something right. Like we, right. if we tell we have something to make that people can actually use, there's not, you know, the, any, anything else is just, um, it's, uh, it's not gonna last, right. We could put time into marketing library before it's ready, but, what does that do? It doesn't. It doesn't get us anywhere. Um, maybe right. it gets us an email list of people we can contact and so on. So we've really, really focused on on the product. Get get a product out that people want to use. Get to that point where you have that first loop of people on on both sides. You know that you have a full experience where there's people who want to use this. And we don't. You know, fine. Hundred people, two hundred people. You got to get a product out there. You got to get people using it. Focusing on anything else is kind of silly. Mm -hmm. 
And, and like you've done, you only need a, a group of what a few thousand testers to actually start, you know, using it in an experimental state, just so you can get some developmental feedback, right? right. And, and then once you, you've run out of bugs, then you go, okay, it's been a while without a bug, it's ready to go, sort of thing, right? This right. is that what you were saying. There's some, something that's bothered me ever since I ever since I started in business about marketing, and it's that you were talking about hype can't be sustained. And it can't. It's like kind of pumping up a balloon that's got a hole in it. You know, you need, you need more and more air, right? Uh, and eventually, hype starts to tail off, and either you start pumping it again, or it just deflates. And unless there's substance under there to hold it up, a product that actually solves a real problem is really usable, etc., it is just going to deflate. And that's the hype cycle of most ICOs that you see, right? It just and then kind of <laughs> like this, and it eventually comes down to the real price, where it sits on the substance. Maybe that stays up here if it's got real substance, but nine times out of 10, it goes right down to the floor where there's the, the actual value layer, as I would call it, is where it then you know sits for a while. And right. so that was what bothered me throughout the, throughout the years about marketing is these, the, the, world, the world's most successful companies aren't necessarily ones that have the best products. They're the ones that have the best marketing, you know, which is that always bothered me, which is, which is how I got the nickname, the marketing monk, because it was like, I want to revolutionize the marketing industry to be ethical, right? To properly reflect the product rather than distorting the product to look better than it really is. Right, right. And I don't, and I don't know, uh, certainly uh, my claim would not be that marketing doesn't matter or isn't important or that things are one entirely on the product. The history of, of many things is that um, the marketing is just as important. But the analogy that uh, I forget how you just gave it, but it's the same as the, the leaky bucket, right? So like I can pour right. people in. How, but how leaky is my bucket? If I have a great thing, then uh, I can pour people in, they're going to sit. If I have, a, I have a bad thing, then my bucket has a bunch of holes in it, and I'm pour, pour people in, they're all, all, all going to just fall off the bottom. Okay. Um, and so that's that's really exactly what we've done. You know, when we were in, when the library was in alpha, we which was in April, we did have to, we had to fight to get people to run this thing. <laughs> and then, and then it, you know, 80% of people couldn't get it to run, and it wasn't working for them at all, and it was a real struggle. And, and, uh, and we can see and chart and see the progress of like, you know, it's been getting better month after month after month. The bucket's still leaky, right? It's not a, it's not, it's still not a solid bucket, but we're, you know, we, we just keep plugging the holes and then all of a sudden one day you wake up and, and they're, they're all plugged and you've got something that's really great. And then you, and then you can really dial up the, the amount of people that you're pushing in. Yeah, cool. <laughs> so one thing I wanted to ask you about you personally, actually about, cause I, I talk about this on the crypto vest all the time. What's most interesting to me is I don't treat projects because a project is not a thing, right? A project is there's people in there, right? And if there's a team in there, they, they, they come together because they've got a shared belief system, shared values, shared philosophy, whatever, especially in this space, because that's really what ignites a project is some philosophical or value system that, that brings people together, right? So I was wondering what, what sort of experiences have had, you had in your life that have led you to well, you said earlier, you're on library is definitely an anti-authoritarian government project. So how did you come to feel this way about the world? Because that's what fascinates me about these projects. Yeah, well, so there's there's me personally, and then there's the team and the sort of the shared beliefs that the, some of the team members have. I guess I'll, I'll speak to myself personally. Uh, the it's tough to say, you know, I, I kind of wonder about these things myself, the certain beliefs that I have, how innate were those versus how much were they developed by my own okay. experiences. Um, but, you know, because I can look back at times when I was, was 11, 12 years old, probably even younger than that, and, and chafing under the authority that, that the school had or, or whoever. Um, and in terms of the way that I was raised, you know, my parents were always very supportive of me, but they were the kinds of people who let me make my own mistakes the thought that that was the way that I was going to learn things and that, that kind of thing um, versus someone um, controlling me uh, because they know better than I do, mm -hmm. you know, what's best for myself. And my parents weren't libertarians or anything like that, but that, but that was very much their um, parenting style. And in, in, I don't know if this is consequential to that, but love of, of, of freedom of speech and freedom of information for as long as I can remember. I mean, I was, you know, one of the one of the first children of the internet, right? Like, I, you know, I was on. I was lucky that my 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 dad was a bit of a geek, and I was on. You know, 
prodigy and uh and uh, comp and a very early like dial up modem uh right. on a 286 computer like very the very very early days of the internet and seeing that and like that that was so much better than school and the thing <laughs> the information that i was getting how so there, right <laughs> but it's, it's you know there's just there's so much more information out there okay. there were the variety there were, of it like Right. The variety of it, the different perspectives that there's not, you know, like there's not one truth in a book. There's all these different opinions and all these different viewpoints about the world. Right, okay. And, and, and so, uh, you know, I fell in love with that a very long time ago and I kind of see, I, I like the internet. Now I love a lot of the modern internet services. I love Amazon. I have an Amazon prime account. I buy things on the internet all the time. The internet's gotten better. YouTube, having YouTube is better than not having YouTube, but at the same time, I kind of liked more of the, some of the earlier days of the internet a little bit more. It was a little bit more of a wild west. It was a little bit more of uh, there, we're not doing things only on five websites, but there's thousands and thousands of different websites and different experiences and that kind of thing. And library is a bit of a throwback to that. It's not mm. another set service that's trying to swallow up billions of people. It's a decentralized service that leaves them in control. And I think it does, hopefully, We'll, we'll turn back the clock a little bit in terms of the ways that we can, you know, share and access information with one another online. Right. So was an element of that you were talking about when you were discovered the internet? Was it the aspect of being self-directed? Was that a lot to do with it rather than because at school it's like, this is it, right? Regimented. Whereas you let loose on the web and there's a search box, you can type in whatever the hell, the hell you want. Like, was that the appeal? <laughs> Yeah, uh, that I, I think that was part of it. It was also like the information itself. It was also learning that you know, things maybe aren't as cut and dry as they are presented um, when, when you're in a, a public school. You know? Right. Yeah, I think that's got a lot to do with it. But the, the appreciation of how information is granular rather than cut and dry, like you say, I think that's a lot of people have been conditioned into this absolute ways of thinking. It's this or that, or as often there's a spectrum on all of these things, right? I, I agree 100 percent yeah i always try to be very probabilistic in my thinking and not this is not 100 percent true or 100 percent wrong or i you know i'm 90 percent certain that i believe this or i'm 75 you know be really like how confident can i be about this or that and so um that was definitely very in my, in my formative years that was a big thing was learning you know um all of these different views and all these different perspectives about the world mm -hmm. so you're talking about throwback there right so you know andreas yeah. talks he refers to Bitcoin as like the internet of money, not money for the internet. So what just came to my mind is a tagline for library would be like, it's the, the internet of content. Mm, yeah. <laughs> With the protocol, you know, that would be, it's not just a clever tagline. It, it's technically accurate as well. I'm, um, I'm always looking for a better, a better <laughs> tagline. The internet of content. We're, we're at play, share, earn right now, but uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I like can... that. I actually quite like that. Um, what was the other bit on your site there? There was a, it watch, read, and play in a decentralized library controlled by the community. Yeah. That's pretty good. That sounds like a mission statement, <laughs> which I thought was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, well, thank you. Um, so, do you do you have like a a long term vision for library? Like, where, where do you once you see library fulfilling its purpose? What does it look like? Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, if I, I will actually talk about it, but it's a little... It, it, Work in progress? <laughs> I don't, I, I'm almost a little embarrassed, right? Because it's, I, I, you know, if you cross the line to, into being too ambitious, it's it, you start to sound like a crazy person a little bit. Uh, but the the way that I see it, the way that we distribute uh, what approximately 60% of internet traffic mm -hmm. is fundamentally flawed. And, and that's the portion of traffic that is uh, static data. It's the same thing when you look at it and when I look at it. We're getting the same thing, right? A movie, we're getting the same thing. We don't get the same thing when we log into Amazon or these kinds of things. Those are personalized experiences. But when we're watching a movie, when we're downloading a song, these are, we're getting the same thing. So this, this is static data. 60% so um, of the internet traffic would, would fall into this category, approximately. Um, and library can, in, in our opinion, from the ground up, do this in a better way. Uh, and the that includes the delivery of all all content, um, all movies, all books, all songs, all, you know, all video games. And the, the total uh, size of that is, is tremendous. Um, mm -hmm. It's 20, $20 billion a year is spent just moving the bits around. That is the cost that's paid um, moving the, that data around per year. And then $2 trillion a year is what's spent 
that's, that's I actually two thousand billion is another way to think about that right. is what spent uh, uh, actually purchasing that stuff, um, and I the 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 ceiling potential for library is all of it. It's like that. It is designed from the ground up to be to to swallow those other systems. Both, and other both that that transportation system, if we call it the road network, that's the, 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 the twenty billion of, yeah. and discovery, yeah. not just transportation but discovery as well. So that this yes. becomes the world database of all digital content that's available for consumption. I honestly think that's the killer feature of library because, again, going back to my days as a marketeer, that is the one thing that people are bad at, like in business, um, or even, even content creators. What they don't understand is you can't just put your content online, right? And I guess that's the appeal of places like YouTube is that it offers to market your content for you. So, and that's the downside of just pure uh, hosting platforms like BitTorrent or whatever, is that you put your content up there like a, like a website and then you sit there and wait for it to be consumed. And of course it just sits there in the wilderness. Um, and if, it, if, if library were a pure technology project that was looking for technical perfection in, in the way it stores this and that and the other, of course, I don't think it would get anywhere near the traction because it forgets the user experience because both the content creator puts their content up there um, and sites like Udemy, again, if you put a course on Udemy, all you have to do is be the creator and then Udemy will find the customers for you. Right. So I, I see similarly, if content creators start publishing effectively on library, <clears throat> people will start consuming it because they'll search for it and, and you know what I mean? The bigger the community gets, the more chance of their audience being there, right? The so right. point I was making there is that I see that as the the killer feature for library um, beyond another technology platform that hosts and distributes content in a decentralized way that doesn't have a discovery feature. Yeah, yes, absolutely. And I think that that is um, a big part that other a lot of these other places, are, uh, you know, there are people who are trying to, oh, okay, we're going to we're going to just add payments to BitTorrent. Um, right. But that's still, right. uh, you know, a, a, a very poor user experience. How do I find stuff? Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, sure. Um, so we definitely thought about that side of it and wanted to be able to solve that side of it as well. Sure. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about technology. We've established that library runs a blockchain, right, for its database. Uh, is it completely decentralized, or are there any centralized elements to it? Uh, so library is completely decentralized, and then I, I want to be, give an honest answer. So there are a couple of a couple of small things that we're doing now that are, are potential are a little bit of stop gaps, but uh, the the it's it is designed to be entirely decentralized. So you've got a library blockchain that is a decentralized database of content. Mm -hmm. That blockchain points to where that content can be found in a larger decentralized network, uh, and then so that content then gets uh, acquired and accessed in uh, an entirely decentralized way. Now. I am very concerned about the user experience. So they're like, as an example, we do a little thing like uh, right now, when we, when we released library, we saw all of these people were having trouble publishing their content. And these were network issues because there's uh, um, a firewall or, uh, it, or I can't actually get the port open to the public uh, or whatever. So, you know, we did add a little feature where when you first broadcast it, it sends it, it sends it to a server that we control, which then rebroadcasts it, which would not okay. technically be decentralization. But that's not a requirement. You know, you can, uh, if you were able to configure your computer correctly, you wouldn't, you wouldn't need to do that. But we are just, I, I want to be straightforward. I, I wouldn't want to hide something like that. We do do, we are willing to do a little thing like that, like, because we, because I care about the user experience. And for most people, I don't want them to have to sort through how do I, you know, how do I get this thing working correctly? How do I get, you know, so it's like, all right, look, that's a little, ha it's a little bit, it's, you know, it's not ideal, but if that's what we have to do to, to make it work for people, then we'll do something. Like that. Yeah, that's okay. That's a, that's a, that's a service on top though, right? It's not baked right. into the actual way it's supposed to work. Right. It's not baked into the protocol specification and it's not a requirement. And even that we're looking at, is there a way that we can do that? That uh, is, is, is that we can solve that problem in a way that's not relying on us. So we always, we want to eliminate those things. Uh, I'm always telling all the guys on our team, like, it, that, that we, it, it's kind of weird because it's kind of contrary to the ways that a lot of businesses would operate, which is businesses are always like, how can we lock people in? <laughs> to me, the success of library depends on us building a system that we cannot lock people into. If there are any, any locks that we add actually reduce the maximal capacity of library. Mm -hmm. right? If we're adding 
if we're, if we're adding ways that people get locked into our system, that's just another, that's, that is then a vulnerability, right? Because to me, this kind of open system, this method of publishing and sharing data that is completely decentralized, it's not owned by anyone, it's inevitable. So if we're, if we're, if we're trying to, uh, if we, if we were to ever add a layer that locked people in, we're setting ourselves up for failure from the next company that gets the idea that that's not necessary. Right. Um, if that makes sense. It does. It does. What came to my mind there was like, um, locking people in is also locking people out. Yeah. Like new users. Because yeah. like, the more difficult it is to get out, the more difficult it is to get in. So this is a double sided coin. Sort of thing, yeah. and, and we can tell, you know, we talk to people, we've been talking to YouTubers, we've surveyed hundreds of YouTubers, like people are ready. People are not, you know, they, they feel, they obviously appreciate YouTube. It gets them the viewers, but they also feel trapped. They don't feel, comfortable with their reliance on YouTube, that the, the rules can change on them at any time. Mm, that arbitrary they, change of the terms and conditions. Right. They can, the rules can change on them at any time. They can, YouTube can change its algorithm for discovery and my content can fall. And, you know, all of these things that they, they're not, they really don't have that much control. And a system like library puts up, gives us control, a lot more control back to both the people who publish stuff and the people who access stuff. Um, it, it restores control to both of those parties and, and it takes it away from the people in the middle. Right. I've got a question. I actually don't know the answer to this question. When we were speaking just then about, so you, you install library for the first time and then it uh, has to connect to the network somehow. So it goes to the centralized server to figure out where the content is, right? No, no, to figure yeah. out where the content is. No, there's no centralized server to figure out where the content is. So that's, uh, that's the same technology. It's uh, called a distributed hash table. It's the same technology that powers BitTorrent. It's the same way that I can take a BitTorrent. So what, what's in the library blockchain is akin to uh, a, a BitTorrent magnet link. Uh, so there is a, a signature in there, a hash of the uh, a stream hash of the, of the piece of content, and it can use that to find the pieces of the content without a centralized server uh, through a distributed right. hash table. The question I had though is like, I've, no, I've never actually figured this out. Say if I download Bitcoin Core, like the, the, the full node wallet, right? So you, you become a node on the network and, and it's it's a it's a peer-to-peer -peer network so it has to connect to a neighbor and then they connect to neighbors to neighbors and you eventually you prop you get contact with the whole network right the question i've always had is so you download that software how does it know where the first neighbor is jack how does it know where the first neighbor is unless it's hard coded into the you have a list of well in the same way as uh uh you see that bit it's hard coded they're hard coded uh no uh, yeah, there are hard coded node notes. Ah, I'm going to say, I, I couldn't I think, think of how... one of the library developers is okay, cool. like for me, so I Look like, at me. Ah, <laughs> I, I, I get so embarrassed when I don't, I, like, it's weird for me. My, my last company, I was the founder of that company, but I built the product. Uh, and then I, I, I was the initial builder of that product. And as the company grew, I did spend less time on it, but I always was the person who created it originally. Um, and now with this, I you know I have a I have a computer science degree. I've gone through it, but I haven't written very much of the code. I've had I do a lot of the this and other things, and um, it's uh, I, I I sometimes I wish I was able to, I had a, a a little bit of a more deep understanding. I mean, we have five really smart guys um, that are working on that are working on coding library, um, and I certainly do get involved to some extent. But then I'm like, oh, I should really know the answer to that, and I don't. Well, you're a CEO, though. I mean, that's that's a different skill set. Yeah, but I want to know. I want to know. You want to know. I want to know. <laughs> cool. <laughs> There's something else I wanted to run by you, right? And you, you might be aware of this, maybe not. You know Verizon have bought uh, what is it, a vessel. You, you know what a vessel is? I, actually, I don't. No? Okay. It's not. It wasn't a very big company. So Vessel was a... It was an early access platform for content. So say if I was a big time YouTuber, right? I could create a, a vessel account and then I could say, so people would subscribe, it's like $3.99 a year to vessel. That would be the user. Mm -hmm. And in exchange for that $3.99, uh, me as the content creator, I would release my content early on vessel, say three mm -hmm. or five or seven days before yeah. I put it on YouTube, right? Um, there's one of my favorite books here. It's called Free, The Future of Radical Price by Chris Anderson. And I, it's one of the few books I keep on my desk. And it's talking about the future of how do you make money from free, right? And one of the things people will pay for in a free economy is time or convenience. So Vessel had built this business on the back of charging like $4 a month or four, whatever it was, what, yeah, $4 a month 
so people could access content seven days prior to it going public, right? So Verizon have bought Vessel after it's been in existence about two years, I think, Vessel, and they're closing it down. Why, why do companies do that? I why honestly do don't know. It's so weird that it's like, the co- all that happens all the time. Like we spent a 500 million or $3 billion acquiring this company. Then 18 months later, it's like, yep, we're, we're closing it down. I, I, I couldn't imagine why, why they would do that. I mean, was maybe the service was, was floundering. I don't, yeah, I have no idea. I'd never heard of it. All right. I think it was successful, but it, it, okay, sorry, yeah. what, what comes to my mind is that they, or they want to remove competition or something it, in, in the news reports that I was reading, it says that they want to use the technology and integrate it into their ambitions for video streaming and this and that and the other. Um, but my, where I was going with that and why it's relevant to the library discussion is that a whole, whole bunch of YouTubers had found a new way of monetizing their content through Vessel. We're like, yes, get in. And then one day they get a notification. And I think they got the notification about seven days prior. Um, so they, they got the notification Vessel has been acquired by Verizon and they're closing it down in like a week or two's time. Thanks very much. And I was yeah. like, really? You know yeah. what I mean? So you're like, as a business, right? Oh my God. What if that was a third or half of the, of the revenue? Right. right. And then, and you know, there's some guy in, a, in, a, in Verizon office he's, and he's wondering, man, why do people hate us so much? <laughs> right. Like, you know, that guy's out there and he exists. I, it makes no sense. And he gen- I don't. I mean, he I, generally you know, like, doesn't know the answer to that question. He's like, why do people hate us? Right. Uh, you know they're there. It's the same. There's, I'm sure there's hundreds of them at Comcast. I'm sure if you talk to Xfinity executives, they're like, yeah, why do we have such a bad reputation? Uh, the, uh, you know, that is, uh, thank you for this, this T-ball here, Chris, because that's obviously, that's the wonderful aspect of library. We can't do it. We couldn't shut, we couldn't shut it down. We couldn't change the rules. We can't wake up tomorrow and say, you know what, guys, instead of it being free, we want 5%. That's literally something that we don't have the ability to do. And that's part of the appeal. Right. That's, that's intentional. Right. Absolutely. And, and you know, this kind of thing is going to continue happening in the centralized content world, which like creates this incentive to move towards these decentralized systems, these more free and open ones like library. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, because it's only going to be, you're going to slap people in the face so many times before they, you know, they look for a real alternative. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's the inevitable progress of business and technology, right? Which is, uh, someone does something that consumers like, and then another entrepreneur comes along and says, I can do that better and cheaper. And then another, and so on and so on. And library is kind of taking the mentality is let's just go to the floor. Let's just, let's just go. Let's not leave any space left for someone to, to undercut us. Let's just go all the way to the bottom. Let's just do this as, as cheaply and as freely as possible. Let's just go there now, you know? Well, doesn't that like suck out the incentive for you though, as well? Uh, so it's, uh, yeah, uh, to some, we, we, we do have a, a intent to make money off of this company. Uh, our comp, our money actually ends up coming from not from the creators or the consumers, but actually from a, a very, very tiny devaluation in the currencies that those transactions were previously happening in. That is mm-hmm. technically speaking where our profit comes from. Okay. So uh, that's a nice, uh, yes, we're, we want to make money, but uh, we're going to make our money by an incredibly minuscule devaluation of the United States dollar, uh, which hopefully uh, our users will be able to swallow uh, in terms of getting the other, otherwise great benefits of using our platform. Right. I also read that the Library Inc. has retained a bunch of uh, library tokens with a right. view to them increasing in value at a later date, right? Is that is that right? Yes, and that's so, what I meant by that's how our, we, we're we trying to, to make our money, um, which is we are essentially switching an economy. Now those creators can get dollars or whatever, at, or whatever currency, Bitcoin, whatever they want out at the other end, mm-hmm. uh, but the library credits act as the rails for both right. uh, the reservations and the namespace and optionally as the rails for um, payment. And that is how we anticipate making our profit is by um, creating the system and then retaining uh, that 10% is what we've retained for profit of, of those tokens. Okay. So you'll have the, the, the library ecosystem here. All the content will be in there. And the way to get access to that is by paying with library credits, right? That creates demand for library credits and that pushes the price up, right? So people exchange dollars for library credits in order to access the content, right? And right. then that that inflates the value of the library token as more and more people 
vie for them in order to access the content in the platform, right? Right, right. And interactions right now are entirely in credits, but we anticipate building out systems that let, um, you know, I, again, when turn, we want this to be a mainstream technology as much as I love blockchain and, and Bitcoin and all of these things. Most people, I, I don't see people, you know, in the next five years, people are still going to be expecting to pull out a credit card, right? So we have to get to the point of, uh, of, of more, you know, ways that my mom and my grandma could understand how to, how to use it. Well, maybe, uh, a, maybe a third not, do that. Probably not buy Bitcoin and exchange it. It's, it's, you know, maybe, hopefully we'll get there. But, you know, maybe we will, maybe we will be there in three years. Um, but we're preparing for the, the reality that we're not. Right. Well, maybe, maybe a third party will do that. Maybe they'll create a third party service that, excuse me, that displays like queries the library blockchain, displays all the content, but prices it all in pounds or dollars or Bitcoin. And then you pay with Bitcoin. They'll take the Bitcoin and do all of the transactions behind the scenes and then pay the library credits. But from my point of view, I just bought that with Bitcoin. Exactly. Exactly. And that's the, that's the, that's for the world we're we're marching towards, right? But I don't, you know, you guys don't necessarily have to develop that. If you if you, it's up to you. But if you focus on the the library protocol itself, and just say the law of the land is that you have to pay in the native currency, you know, and then innovation can be abound on top of that. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we're not actively working on that today, but we that's something that you know, it's not a given that we'll we'll do that. But I think that there's a decent chance that we will 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 be involved in that. But again, it's done in a way, you know, it's never a requirement to use us. If you want to take the library credits and exchange them with service B, C, or D, you're welcome to, to do that. Yeah. Couldn't, couldn't I build that service today though, right? I could set up a, a web app that queries the library blockchain and pulls all the content out, displays it, and then takes Bitcoin and does the, the, trend, the uh, foreign exchange bit on the background. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you could build all kinds of fun stuff with the library blockchain today. And it's actually, if there are, I don't know if, if there's any developers or whatever listening to the show, it's really easy to run, uh, to run the library blockchain and you can bridge to it and make API calls and, and you could write all kinds of fun stuff like image hosting sites and video sharing sites and all, all kinds of other tools um, can be built on top of the library blockchain. Cool. Cool. Last question with, uh, I wanted to ask you a whole bunch of other things, but we're almost out of time. One key thing I did want to ask you though is from the tokens that library inc has reserved for your own equity stake right to incentivize you to actually make this thing successful you've earmarked specifically a reasonably sized chunk of that for charity is this correct it, it's not um it's broader than charities it's just generally institutions uh other the, so they could be charities they could be groups like eff or aclu or groups like that what's that um what then they're not familiar to me Oh, uh, so Electronic Frontier Foundation is, uh, uh, is the, I guess those are both more, uh, they're pretty international. They just defend digital rights. Um, they're, the, they're one of the groups that's always fighting, you know, to keep the internet free and open and safe. And ACLU is an organization that's always fighting for free speech and defending First Amendment rights inside of the United States. Uh, um, so it, it, it could be groups like that. It could be other institutions that... Um, can do something useful with the library network or could you know, these aren't these these would never be giveaways like but an example would be um to uh, to 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 do a, a block grant of credits um to an institution that is interested in making sure that you know artist rights are protected or things like that um, but basically so that uh there's there's some leeway there to get other large organizations uh, or significant organizations that want to support the ideals of library of course Right. Uh, but it's a chance to, to build relationships with them and get them uh, on, onto the system. Okay, that, that makes perfect sense because those yeah. things you mentioned are in direct alignment and support of what library stands for anyway. Exactly. So that's exactly. Con entirely congruent with yeah. uh, what you stand for. So that's cool. Well, Jeremy, thank you very much for being on the Cryptoverse. Is there anything you'd like the viewers to know before we part? Uh, well, of course, I got. I have to plug the incredibly long list of ways. I was going to say, connect. how do people gonna, contact you? Are you going to do that for me? I'll do it. I'm going to do it. You go you go, you gotta, of course, go to the website, lbry.io. If you go to slash get, um, that is where you can get into the beta. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at library.io. You can follow us on Reddit at, at our library. You can follow us on Facebook at slash library.io. Uh, and if you really want to interact with us, if you want to hang out with us, if you want to, if you have a question that wasn't asked here and you want to start talking to me right away, you can join our Slack channel at slack.lbry.io. Um, you know, this 
this project absolutely depends on the community to make it successful. We've already had, you know, there's already thousands of people on our Slack channel. There's already thousands of people uh, running library and interacting with library, but you know, we want to keep meeting the, the great people who get this idea um, and keep working with them and learn from them. And, and especially if you're a creator, you know, we want to work with you and we want to make this service as great as we can for you. Absolutely. Great. So I'll list all of those links uh, in the description for this show. So everyone can find you. I mean, I'm in the library Slack. So if you want to come talk to me in there, do that. But uh, until next time, thank you very much for joining me for being on the Cryptoverse. Thanks, Chris. All right. See you soon, mate. So thanks for joining me today, guys. If you like this episode, hit the like button. If you disliked it, hit the dislike button. Leave me a comment below with some feedback and get subscribed. Or even consider supporting me directly by going to cryptoversity.com forward slash podcast and sending me a Bitcoin tip to the address on that page. If you would like to support me without actually spending any money, then click on the Steemit logo, vote for this episode on the Steam Network. That will get me some cryptocurrency without having to spend a penny. If you're the type of person that would like something physical in exchange for your donation, click on the store button. You can get yourself a t-shirt with the Cryptoversity branding on it. That kind of thing helps me out a lot. Or if you would like more structured information on Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies and blockchains, click on the courses button and buy yourself an online course. That's all for today. So until the next episode of the Cryptoverse, it's me, Chris Coney, saying bye for now.